You're listening to the Business Mike Podcast. Amazing interviews with entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business Mike Podcast. And joining me today is Lynn. Uh, Lynn, can you just share with the listeners a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes, I'm Lynn Hunsaker and my company is Clear Action Continuum. And we have the Experience Leadership Mastery Curriculum that is really designed for anyone from new college grad all the way up to the senior leadership team and the board of directors to get on the same page with a modern vision for customer experience, employee experience, and partner experience excellence. So essentially we do e-learning, but it's not e-learning in the kind of basic sense that you've known from other places. This is where I used to love to do consulting, but I don't like invoices and all of that rigmarole. So during the pandemic, I retooled everything to put all of my consulting wisdom into self-paced courses, as well as uh, live courses and live uh, action planning template sessions, things like this, and, a, and also a community where people can learn how to do the cultural aspects of customer experience, employee experience, and partner experience excellence. Right. Um, I'm very excited to have you on. This is an interview I've been looking forward to, especially having been on your website and seen all the content that you're putting out there. And just before we started recording, we're having a, a little chat and you're telling me about um, the history of customer experience. So how exactly has it evolved uh, mm. from the early 90s all the way till now? What, what, what have you seen that has stood out in terms of its transformation? Yeah. So interestingly, my first job was in a strategic planning department of a big company, about 250 on the Fortune 500 list. And they had asked me to go and talk to customers around the country and uh, ask them about their opinions of our value. How do we compare to competitors on various features? And so we did face-to-face -face interviews with some tactile exercises to do that. It was really a huge uh, boost to have this foundation in my career. But see, they wanted to join the total quality management uh, movement. And this was just at the point where Fred Reicheld had published his pivotal article in 1990 called Zero Defections, Quality Comes to Services. It was published in the Harvard Business Review, and it was the first time that people had seen proof that when you retain customers, you're going to gain a lot more revenue than just continually uh, acquiring new customers can, and not really worrying about how long they stay with you. So uh, that's where I became voice of the customer in 1991. So the main point I'm trying to make is that back in that time, there was a huge push to use customer insights to make a change for your products and services and your product processes and your policies to be more customer centric. There was a huge push for that and people felt the pressure for it because we were feeling a lot of, uh, well, Japan was introducing a lot of really nice products that people preferred over American products. And so the American companies needed to make these changes in order to keep jobs and to, um, you know, to thrive. So what I've seen over the years is uh, CRM came along that really captured people's attention over and above TQM. Uh, so, you know, things didn't really go away, but things evolved in companies so that by the time uh, 2011 came around and CXPA was organized, for example, people in companies that I had seen uh, pr present back in the 1990s said they were totally new. Their company was totally new at customer experience, which wasn't really true. It's just the label, right? It's just the label. <laughs> but what's happened is uh, in 2009, we had a huge push with customer experience jobs. Before this, I was looking on LinkedIn in 2006, 2008, and not seeing very many customer experience jobs on LinkedIn, for example. But uh, 
when the global pandemic hit, then customer experience jobs became really important because people realized they needed to hold on to their existing customers. They needed to maximize the revenue from existing customers. And also they wanted to bounce back to pre-global uh, economic downturn times quicker than anyone else in their industry. So they knew that the key to that was figuring out how to be close to customers. The problem was that during the 2010s, people were really enamored with technology. Uh, they began to take their playbook from, from technology firms and also that push to just survive economically kind of took over in the, the way that we think about doing customer experience practices. So frankly, I think that uh, during the 2010s, we became less customer centric in the name of being customer centric. We really were uh, self-centric in a lot of the, these practices. Now with the pandemic, everyone in the world is realizing we need to pay more attention to employees' well-being and customers' well-being. Yet, we have not yet shifted the practices of customer experience or employee experience to do a good job for that with today's needs. Today's needs are trust. People want to feel that you get them, that you understand their, val their values and that you're contributing to their values. And frankly, the way that we're doing surveys and a lot of other things still are kind of self-centric. They're not really conveying that you're, you're recognizing them as the hand that feeds you. Right. Every company relies on employees to exist and employees rely on customers to exist and investors rely on all of that. So we usually put the horse before the cart and it's time to make some shifts. Yeah, and that, that brings me to the point that I wanted to discuss with you, and that's the the way silos impact uh, customer experience. You wrote a wonderful article on your website that has um, 10 different silos and, and their impact on customer experience. So can you just walk through us through some of them and how these silos, because they actually ring true when you break them down. I can see how each of these actually impacts every organization, regardless of what industry you're in. So how exactly do these various silos uh, uh, impact customer experience? Yeah, well, if you think about what people complain about when they're around the water cooler or, you know, any kind of informal conversation that employees have with one another, they're complaining about silos. This organization is not on the same with, page with this other organization. So that's an organizational silo. Uh, you can't get cooperation and collaboration. They don't share data. Uh, they're on, they have different agendas. That's a huge pain for every customer experience manager and pretty much any, but any other type of manager. And of course, there's data silos, process silos, system silos. And, uh, all of those are what I would call operational. Now, when you think about the reasons why these things happen, it's the clue is in what I first talked about, that people have different agendas. So you got to think about these other five execution silos, which are vision silos, assumption silos, uh, goal silos, metric silos, and handoff silos, right? The so handoff silo example is when you're throwing stuff over the fence, just saying, well, service will take care of that. You know, we have to we have to make this product launch deadline or whatever you, it may be. You don't really care what the consequences are. Or it's not going to bother you. Uh, there's somebody else to take care of that. And it just creates an extra burden. I call it Jenga management, right? You think of this uh, party game with the little blocks and it's a big stack and the, you're challenged to take a block out and take a block out and you don't want the stack to fall over. So uh, that party game of Jenga is fun, but it's not very fun and wise in business, cutting corners where you're actually weakening your stack and throwing stuff over the, over the top that just makes it, yeah, in the Jenga game, you have to put your, your uh, the, 
the uh, block that you take out of the middle back on the top of the stack so it becomes really wobbly. So I think it's a really good analogy for what happens when you have execution silos. Assumption silos would be an example of uh, everyone kind of thinks they know what customers expect because they used to be a customer themselves or maybe they've been in this industry for so long uh, and they're not really basing their views on customer data and having a shared vision of an intentional customer experience. So, you know, taking a lot of things for granted is an assumption silo. And probably the other ones uh, kind of speak for themselves, having different goals that might um, uh, sub-optimize the progress of another group, uh, different metrics. Metric silos is what I think is how, to, how things actually work. When you only look at metrics at the um, what's going on in the customer's world, like the defects that are out there, the behaviors that customers have, the financials that they're doing, those are all lagging indicators because they're out of your hands. The, the, the train has left the station. <laughs> the, the horse has left the barn. Uh, you can't really make an, uh, an adjustment on those metrics because they're out in the market. So that is a metric silo when you're only looking at dashboards of lagging indicators. You need to be connecting your lagging indicators, all of those popular metrics, with things that you're doing inside your workflows that are the precursors, you know, what's actually causing those defects, what's causing that uh, lack of timeliness or lack of responsiveness, what's causing that poor quality. Uh, I call those pebbles in customer shoes. So one of the beauties of silos, when you understand them in these two camps of execution silos and operation silos, is that if you are to focus on the execution silos, getting people having a shared vision, uh, breaking those myths of different assumptions about what customers care about or different groups of customers' expectations, what are the gaps, uh, where do we really stand, getting your data really clean and pure and uh, helping people absorb that, uh, you know, that will go a long way really to rallying people around truth and around the costs of all of this poor experience. So these execution silos are the key to operational silo success. If you're feeling like you really would like your data to not be siloed anymore, pay attention to the execution silos, and then people will help work together for the, uh, for the data silos. Right, and one thing I noticed um, about all the different silos is, it's in the word itself, there's silos. These are people working in their own departments and they're not necessarily helping one another. Um, to aid the customer, they're just looking out for themselves. And that ideally comes down to the culture when you think about it. So how how do you, um, as a CX manager, as the business leader, try and rally the troops to get behind this sort of customer-centric way of thinking, especially if you're dealing with departments that aren't uh, front-end, they don't directly talk to the customer, how and why would they even care about mm -hmm. being customer-centric? That's where the challenge is. So I think that uh, ironically in CX, we usually feel like we're a victim of all of this. And it's actually the opposite is true. Customer experience people have more power than HR or whoever in changing the culture. Here's why. Culture is, if you look in the dictionary, two things, how people think and how they do. So you look at one group, you know, it may be the city or this rural town or, you know, this uh, department and that department, everyone has their subculture, right? There's little, little cultures of every group. What is it that shapes that group's thinking and their doing? So it's the way they think about what's important, how they get ahead, how they get behind. And when you can tap into what's those threads, those commonalities uh, within a group, 
that is your key to making some adjustments. Now, why is customer experience so uh, powerful potentially with all of this? Because we have access to customer insights and all we need to do is connect those insights to money. We may not have the whole cost or the whole revenue associated with an issue or a behavior or a trend or a group of customers that want something or don't want something. But tell people, hey, this is happening and 49% or 72% or whatever the number is, don't like it. And with the data that I could access quickly, which is just this, it's costing us such and such a mon money for returns or for uh, service calls or for churn or whatever it might be. Now, that's not the whole picture, but imagine what it might be just based on how big this number is. So we need to get in the habit of talking about customer experience insights using money. When you do that, you tap into people's thinking. My gosh, that can't stand. That's ridiculous. Look how much money is going down the drain. Think of how much we could have extra for a salary increase or hiring more help or getting that uh, new equipment or something that would help us with our, our goals, even profit sharing. So there's so many ways that we would love to have that money back, but it's going down the drain because people aren't thinking about running the business in the proper way. So uh, as you help people to absorb your customer insights, uh, then adopt the insights by realizing that can't stand. What can I do about it? Then you need to also guide them how to act on it. So with customer experience, we usually think that our job is doing stuff to the customer. It's external. Not true. We need to understand customers, and that might take up 50% of our effort. But the other 50% should be how do we minimize silos by helping people think differently and behave differently. See, if HR and finance and corporate audit uh, would know about this risk reduction that CX can do, uh, the cost containment that it would uh, affect, so much smarter than just cross the board cuts and uh, trying to minimize average handled times or trying to make the co contact center a profit center, ridiculous. All of it's just crazy. It doesn't make any sense. What I'm talking about with silos is the huge key. And if you have a steering committee or a CX council, I would uh, suggest that their main charter should be, how do we be silo detectives? What are things that we could do to smooth this over and to connect these things and these people and so on? That would probably make more progress than anything else that a, a steering committee does. Uh, even if customer experience work was mostly about silos, I think that we would have a lot happier customers. And, and, and on that point, um, what are some examples of companies, if you've come across any, that are actually doing it right, that uh, don't have all these silos uh, preventing them from giving their customers the best experience? And, and how did they manage to achieve that? Well, I don't know, you know, like a, a list of companies necessarily, but um, I've seen several examples where they're on the right track. Uh, one I really loved was a data um, data storage company where they were looking at all the different types of customer insights that came through in a month. And they decided to consolidate those insights into one report for every general manager each month. Now that seems like quite a lot of work to me, maybe every other month or every quarter might work for a lot of companies, but they had a little team of people that would uh, pull together it was customer advisory boards, user groups, transaction survey, some kind of industry survey that was done somewhere, whatever. They pulled it, pulled it together. Now, what the beauty of what they were doing is before they published it, they brought in 
someone from that general manager team to review it and give comments. So that they could usually call it a CX champion. And uh, from that conversation, they would realize, oh, this thing that we're seeing happen with the customer feedback uh, was spurred by something that our competitors did. Or it's when we had this change in our uh, manufacturing or marketing or something. And so those reports became stories. They became more actionable. They became more in insightful. It was real customer intelligence when you connect the dots between different sources of customer insights and you start to see patterns that show when this happens, then customers are three times more likely to do X and so on. So uh, I love that example. Um, it was EMC that's now owned by Dell. Um, I love what I heard from one of my friends that used to work with Ritz Carlton for quite a long time. Uh, she said that everything that people know about the customer facing people, having real attentiveness to customers, um, having some kind of empowerment to accommodate and make, make special arrangements as customers need to be really high, not high, high level in, um, taking care of customers, she says the same standards apply to IT, to marketing, to uh, safety and, and facilities and everybody behind the scenes. They're also expected to pay attention and know what customers care about and to make sure they have very strong uh, treatment of internal customers as well as external customer needs in everything they do. So to me, those are two examples of minimizing silos because they're helping people to see the whole picture. They're helping to put the horse before the cart in uh, respecting customers and respecting employees within that context to uh, really focus on those values and those common needs as the main purpose of every job. Right. I really love what you said there about uh, having the, the, the picture being understood and seen by everyone, regardless of whatever department they're in. That 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 actually is a very key point. Um, just before we end the interview, I'd love to know from yourself, you've been doing customer experience for some time, but what is it about this profession that you love the most? I always think of it, think of it as making a difference in the world, making the world happier. Um, when I think about the number of hours that people spend on the telephone waiting to get help or uh, all kinds of things that go wrong, think about how much could be saved and how much more happiness there could be if we could prevent that, if people didn't really ever have to call an, uh, for help. Um, not just because there was excellent self-service, but just because we would not create issues in the first place. And people would only need to call because they had a, an address change or a new baby or something like this. Uh, of course, we're in a human world and that's never going to happen. But what if we could make it happen 80% less than it does now? I think it's possible. And uh, I like to think that what I'm doing, the way that I'm helping people to see a different path to being more preventive, being more collaborative, uh, being more accountable, and being more uh, business savvy and connecting everything to financials could really make a huge difference in, say, the next 10, 15 years. This really propels my energy. Right. And uh, just before you go, if anyone listening to this is in uh, the C-suite or uh, a top level manager in the organization, but they haven't really embraced or understood what customer experience is and its uh, importance to a business, what parting words of advice would you have uh, for them? Think of customer experience as brand integrity. A, a bad customer experience means that something went wrong and why did something go wrong in the customer's eyes was you promised something and they didn't get it. 
So that's a lack of brand integrity. This is the primary purpose of your chief customer officer or VP of customer experience. It's the primary purpose of your senior leadership team to insist on brand integrity. If you always delivered 100% what you promised, well, whether you're a luxury firm or some kind of discount firm, you're going to be successful because people have the expectation of what you promised and when they get what, what you promised them, almost always they're fine with that. So I think that if we change how we are looking at who we're serving, how the money actually flows from customers eventually to investors, and how we need to be making sure that we do what we say to stop all this nonsense, we'll go a lot further. One uh, The last thing about customer experience definition is that it's nothing more really than uh, realities meeting or exceeding expectations. We knew this very clearly in the early 1990s with customer satisfaction, but things have become really conflated and uh, kind of just kind of twisted around in what people think customer experience is, making, th making people happy or delighted in the moment so they can do more for you. Uh, it's more cumulative than that. So keeping it simple with realities, meeting or exceeding expectations and brand integrity, I think is real key for senior leaders. All right. And uh, just before you go, can you let the listeners know how they can get in touch with you? I'll definitely put a link to the article about the silos impacting uh, mm -hmm. CX in the description below. But um, for anyone else who wants to get in touch with you and connect how and where can they find you? Sure. Well, my website is clearaction.com. So it's one word, two words made into one, clear action, basically that you can clear, see clearly what needs to be done and take action. So clearaction.com and then LinkedIn. I'm Lynn Hunsaker, H-U-N-S-A-K-E-R. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of this interview. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, for taking the time to share with us all your experience in customer experience. I know uh, the people listening and watching this that have learned a lot and that uh, will implement some of the things we've discussed today to put uh, smiles on customers' faces and having less of those um, phone calls complaining. So thank you so much and I uh, wish you the very best. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been really fun. Thank you. Thank you.